Hello and welcome to this session of Let's Talk Forensic Psychology. So today we're really lucky to have Professor Ray Bull with us. Um, he's made a major contribution to forensic psychology throughout his long career. He's the Mertis Professor of Forensic Psychology at the University of Leicester, a visiting professor at the University of Portsmouth, and also a part-time professor of criminal investigation at the University of Derby. So that's a lot to do. It's a busy day. Um, in March 2021, he was informed that Stanford University had created a database of top scientists based on global influence and career um, long, and in that particular year, 2019, and Ray's name was included in the top 2% regarding his career and the top 4% in the world in that citation year of 2019. Um, other awards have included being the first honorary lifetime member of the International Investigative Interviewing Research Group. Um, he was also elected by acclaim as an honorary fellow of the BPS for his contributions to the discipline of psychology. He's received numerous prestigious awards for his extensive contribution to investigative in interviewing. And I recall him being awarded for the BPS Award for Distinguished Contributions right back in 2008. Um, he previously received accommodation by the London Metropolitan Police for innovative and professionalism while investigating um, complex rape cases, which is a, obviously a really important area. So he's a really influential person and we're really lucky to have you here and given your time today with all your busyness. Um, the most recent work we've been looking at is your international group um, looking at principles of effective interviewing for investigations and information gathering. And um, we'll put the link to this in the show notes so that people can read the report. It's a fascinating report. So we just wondered, Ray, if you'd start talking a bit about um, how you became a forensic psychologist or what made you decide to do that before we get to the details of the report. Well, may I say thank you for the very generous introduction. The trouble with generous introductions is the rest of it's downhill from now on <laughs> after that. But, but, but thank you for that. Uh, why I never became a psychophysiologist was because the Home Office was so pleased with the professor's work, you know, which I, I helped him with, that they offered him a second year. So then I did two years with that. And then uh, in those days, believe it or not, it was possible to get a good academic position without having a PhD if you had published enough and you, you got good references. So uh, the senior profs where I was working said, you don't need to go back to do a PhD because you've published sub two stuff from your BSc, you've published four studies from your unfunded year, you've published a couple of studies on the police because much of it we couldn't publish. So they said, that'll be enough to get you a job. I said, is it? And they said, yeah, yeah, yeah. So so then I, I, I took up a job in London in, in cognitive psychology. And very soon after I started there, the guy who was my liaison at the Home Office for the police job, he contacted me and he said, there's a, a review happening, an official government judicial review of why honest, honest eyewitnesses can be mistaken. You know, this is long while ago. This is like 1976, something like that. And he said, I know you're good at research, so we'd like you to write an overview of everything that's known on this topic, which is now called eyewitness memory, that we didn't have a label at the time. And we said, we'll pay you. So I said, oh, all right then. <laughs> uh, so I wrote that and uh, I got feedback on it, that, which was quite good. So I was talking with another cognitive psychology colleague, uh, a lovely guy called Brian Clifford who was much better cognitive psychologist than I was. He was really into intellectually deep theory, whereas I was more in, always interested in the applied, because one of my A-levels had been applied maths. Uh, and we, Brian and I were having, having a discussion, we shared an office, and out of that discussion, it probably was Brian, it may have been me, we said, oh, why don't we write a book about all this then? Uh, so we wrote a book, and it was published in 1978 with the stupid title of Psychology of Person Identification, because as I say, though eyewitness memory had begun to be the phrase in the USA, uh, we didn't use that because it didn't make any sense for English police and the few academics working. So that's a long answer, but it was an open question, so I blame you, uh, <laughs> how I began in forensic psychology. 
No, it's fantastic. We've had everybody has such different routes in and it's really interesting to hear all the routes in because we try to talk to people about qualifying routes and there just isn't one, is there? There's so many paths, winding paths yeah. there. So that's a lovely story. Although it does really also say about, um, you know, just who you're with, trying to bounce ideas of other people. It's so lovely to hear people think, oh, let's just write a book on this. Because in some ways that still kind of happens Mm. the circles when you meet people oh you know you've got this chapter and you've got this chapter and let's all get together and yeah absolutely yeah and what does a day in the life of ray look like then because it sounds like you're you're very busy well <laughs> fortunately i'm not over busy uh i've set up on my finances to expect to retire at 65 uh so i didn't need to continue but a guy who was doing a PhD with me who had spent 30 years as a professional investigator for a, a British uh, crime investigating organization, lovely guy called Dave Walsh. So we were having dinner one evening as we had our supervisions off in another pub. And he said to me, when he, when he starts his new job, would I help him? And I said, yeah, we become mates. Sure, I'll help you. He said, no, no, I don't want you to help me as a friend. And I said, what? He said, now I've spoken to university and they would like to employ you for two years, one day a week to help him get used to working in the university to be his buddy, so-and-so, so-and-so. Uh, so I did that. So I still, I still, as you said, uh, even several years later, spend part of my time, uh, obviously online at the moment, supervising PhDs and helping in course development and mentoring at, at a wonderful place, Derby, which is really exciting and expanding in forensic psychology. And the other half of my time, until the pandemic, much of that time I was lucky enough to spend abroad. You know, I've been lucky enough to go to countries that when I was a child, I didn't even know where they were, like Peru. Obviously, I knew where China was, but, uh, you know, I've been lucky enough to, to go to so many countries uh, and having a part-time job, I can sometimes add on a few days tourism, which my full-time colleagues don't have the time to do. I remember once when I was in full-time employment, I flew to Sydney, spent two nights there, had to come back again. And then two days later, I went to Vancouver and came back three days later. I don't have to do that anymore. Mm -hmm. So normally I'm away quite a lot, but of course, like everybody, uh, since the pandemic, uh, I'm mostly at home. And earlier today, I was having a minor, very minor role in an international conference that would, would have been held in Malaysia face to face without the pandemic. So in a sense, I would have been in Malaysia right now. Obviously, I would still do this. But, but yeah, like everybody else, I'm at home and... Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah. It must feel impressive to think that you're getting forensic psychology from your home to Malaysia. I was thinking about that wide reaching, almost how the pandemic has been able to provide a much bigger platform for people to work yeah. internationally. Yes. I mean, Chichester, Malaysia, somewhere else, all in one day. I mean, it's. Yeah, I never that... thought that could happen, really. That's. Well, don't tell the organisers, because when the pandemic is over, I would like to be able mm. to visit some interesting places. I mean, I'm lucky enough where I live is quite interesting. I'm lucky enough to have a garden. Mm. Uh, and most people don't even have that. Mm. Uh, but yeah, so when I set off in my car, I didn't go on the train to the north of England. And I don't want to insult people in prison. But it was a bit like getting out of a Jail's too strong a word, but staying in a hotel for the first time in a, over a year mm. with a sea view in Whitley Bay, where Gavin lives. Uh, mm. That was just amazing. I, I found it very emotional. Yes, yeah. No, I think that's an important point that we forget what it is like to be, you know, we've, we noticed that. So what it must be like for people with a 20-year sentence. That's exactly, yeah. yes. Yeah, you can't take it for granted, can you? So you've been involved with the Division of Forensic Psychology or before it was even called that <laughs> um, yeah. for many years. Um, and you've recently worked to develop principles of effective interviewing and produced a report um, which looking at um, the, the way people ask questions and investigate 
And one of the things I noted was that you wanted questioning to move away from being accusatory and mm -hmm. coercive and manipulative and confession driven and yeah. all the poor building. Um, so we wondered how you sort of got involved in that piece of work, because again, that's a really international piece of work. So how did you get involved in that in the first place? Well, Laura early, earlier emphasised during our chat, you know, the importance of working with other people. And it, again, it all became largely by chance. So I said earlier in our, in our chat, when we worked on improving the memorability of information given to patrol officers, uh, that then became national. And I was asked to go and check it out in a variety of, of police forces. So I got to know more police people. And then in the 1980s, when the Metropolitan Police were the first police organization within the UK to formally decide that in the initial training of police, the first two years called probation of police officers, they decided to bring in a lot of topics that had psychology as a component to them to increase the training by 30%. So they talked about improving people who join the police. Some already have good interpersonal skills, but some don't, particularly on patrol in difficult circumstances. Uh, believe it or not, in, this is 1980-81, they thought that police officers, quite rightly, would need greater what they called cultural awareness and also greater self-awareness. You know, as we, we know as psychologists, that the better to some extent you know the strengths and weaknesses that can help you when you interact in difficult circumstances with other, with other people. So they developed a curriculum and they decided to ask me to evaluate how well it went. And again, it was a one year grant that ended up being six one year grants. And during that time, I got to know quite a lot of uh, police officers in London. And one of them, uh, Tom Williamson, who in part of his career was the head of the murder squad in the Met, the largest murder squad in the world. So he was a real, what they used to say, a copper's copper, you know. But even though he'd left school at 14, he was a rising star in the Met. And before I met him, he, he was awarded a scholarship to go to university to do a bachelor's degree. And he chose not to do business studies or law or organizational behavior that the few predecessors who'd been funded by the police to get a degree had done. He chose psychology. So what happened was when the chiefs of police and the government decided, based on early research in the late 1980s, when the mandatory recording of police interviews with suspects, audio tape recording, was mandatory in England and Wales since 1986. And there was a small number of government funded studies or a couple of police officers doing their PhDs who analyzed these recordings. And, and they concluded that much of the interviewing was unskilled. It was pretty inept. And the obvious reason for that was the persons who had that difficult job hadn't been given any, any training or very little training. So a committee of experienced detectives was, was set up to produce a whole new concept of interviewing, a whole raft of training. And the guy I mentioned, Tom Williamson, he was not on that committee, but because he was quite senior by now, he uh, invited a, a couple of other psychologists and a couple of other detectives, and I was one of the psychologists, to meet on Sundays to gather together what was known in psychology and allied disciplines that might be useful to the detectives who had been charged with coming up with some new ideas about training, new training. Uh, so we passed a lot of psychology. We, uh, with help of people like Stephen Moston and a psychologist. We passed information, often written in, in everyday street language by now, not academic way of doing it, because it was felt that the senior detectives weren't used to reading ac academic writing. Mm -hmm. You had to write like you're writing for a newspaper. So we passed this information over to them. And to my complete surprise, one day a big parcel arrived in my university office addressed to me and I opened it and it was from, from the uh, working party of detectives. And the gist of it was, uh, dear professor, uh, we have taken on board a lot of the psychology that uh, was passed to us under the auspices of the uh, Tom Williamson. 
And we've tried to include a lot of it in all the documents and philosophy that are in this package. But we are not psychologists. So would you mind having a look through it to see if we've got, and I quote them, have we got the psychology right? And it was amazing. You know, if, if we were grading people on how to write about psychology for the real world, you know, we would have given them a clear distinction. They'd done an amazing job. And, you know, I could barely find anything to help improve. Uh, and so a lot, of, a lot of psychology is in what they call the peace method. Mm -hmm. And then subsequent uh, to my somewhat involvement in, in helping them develop the peace method, I was then asked by the Home Office to evaluate the interviewing done by the first people who helped, had the new training. The new training began in 1992. So I had this grant from like 94 to 96, I think it was. And the first people who received the training were the very experienced officers who interview suspects in the most difficult circumstances. And so uh, because it was a government funded project, you know, getting access to recorded interviews, which is always difficult, even nowadays, it's difficult. Uh, that wasn't really an issue. Uh, so I began a path, uh, which I still continue on, which is, you know, helping investigators improve their skills in a variety of ways and in part by by analyzing what they've done and say, saying yeah you did this really well we weren't so bad at this so there is room for improvement you are rubbish at this so don't ever do it again mm. uh, you know because if people are rubbish it's hard to get them up to satisfactory but you can stop them doing you know certain things that and replace it with other things and then what happened was the United Nations, as everybody knows, have a, a large number of worldwide charters, like there's one that's very relevant to forensic psychology, the rights on the child, which basically say in any situation whatsoever, the primary consideration is always the child. And of course, that has a lot of impact in forensic psychology. Uh, in a good way, you know, forensic psychologists would want to do that anyway, but some other organizations don't have the child as the highest priority. And there is another charter, which is loosely called the anti-torture charter. It's about not having torture or inhumane and cruel treatment. And almost every country in the world has signed up to that UN charter. But for each charter, a world expert is appointed by the UN for five years to see how well that charter is being followed by the countries that have signed up to it. And if there are any countries that have not signed up to it, to encourage them to sign up to it. So the special rapporteur for the, uh, let me loosely call it anti-torture charter, uh, is a very gracious and clever man, a lawyer, Professor Juan Mendez. Uh, and in his final report, because you can only do these jobs for five years, they're so demanding, to the UN, he recommended what he called that a universal protocol, a worldwide guidance document, be written on how to interview suspects without torture, without cruelty, without inhumane treatment. And uh, you know, when you ask some countries which on the record or off the record, in those countries, torture still exists, which it does in some countries. What they say is, well, we need to get information. And we, of course, say, well, all you get is rubbish when you torture people. Uh, they don't necessarily accept that. But what, of course, they would say is, well, if you want us to talk, stop torturing, give us something else that will be effective. And so Professor Mendez and colleagues, they, they scanned everything they could find on how to get information from suspects. And they came across our work. Uh, and I'm embarrassed to say this in public, that on two occasions, I was invited to, to go to New York where the United Nations are. But because of other commitments, it sounds so stupid. I couldn't go. Like the second time I was invited was the very day I was to give the welcome speech to all the delegates in a face-to-face -face annual conference of the European Association of Psychology and Law of which I happen to be the president. And the invitation to go to New York wasn't that clear. It was a bit vague. So I didn't really realize the significance of it, but I realized later because then what happened was when he produced his report. So those invitations were before the report, I should have said, 
uh, a very good friend of mine who's led developments around the world, uh, a Norwegian police officer has got a PhD called Aspion Raklev. Aspion messaged me and said, this report has just been published by the UN rapporteur. You need to look at page 24 right now. And so I opened this document and I looked on page 24 and not only was there the recommendation that the UN adopt the principle of there being a worldwide document uh, that it would approve of. Uh, but in his report, he said that a good example of what this universal protocol should look like was the peace method developed in England and Wales. And that was just amazing. Uh, so the next time I was invited to New York, I made sure, I firmly made sure that I would go. So I, ha I had to go there and explain what the peace method was, uh, what the research evidence was, that it's effective, that it's uh, well accepted uh, by detectives uh, and, and so on. And so the United Nations Secretary General uh, recommended to the UN what Professor Mendes had recommended. So that was accepted. So then a committee was set up uh, about a year later, 2017, 2018, to write the thing. And I've been lucky enough to be one of the 15 people, it's called the steering committee, that uh, we, we were able to have some drafts from other people. I mean, Professor Chris Meisner from the USA wrote an excellent overview of the published research on this topic of how to interview suspects. Uh, so we, we had contributions from other people. And on that committee, because the, uh, the principles of effective interviewing not only talk about the act of interviewing, but the context in which it happens. And in the legal world, they're called safeguards. Like here in the UK, we are, we are well aware uh, of the importance of a suspect having the choice to have a lawyer present if they wish. That's not very common in many other countries. You know, As I say, since 86, these interviews have to be tape recorded. Uh, that doesn't happen very elsewhere. So there are lots of things about having breaks that are called safeguards. So the document is a mixture of law and safeguards and mostly psychology interviewing. And we, we had a first meeting. I was so pleased when, it, when the invitation came to. I had to go all the way to Brazil, to Rio de Janeiro, oh. to, to have a meeting. <laughs> and at that meeting, uh, said it would be so easy to write this document in two parts. Here's all the existing United Nations conventions and what we in the UK call common law, you know, that you, if you're an investigator, society expects you to believe, behave in this way. There may be no law about it, but that's what you should do. So there's a mixture of law and there's this stuff on interviewing. And it's very difficult because the nature of the discourse is different. If you ever read stuff written in law or if you're a lawyer, you read psychology, it's almost like a foreign language. And so we had a long and fruitful debate about should we be lazy and write the document in two sections? Or should we try to be adventurous and interweave the two? Which had not really been done before. And one of the reasons it took us three years to come up with the final document, which is now publicly available, was the understandable challenges and difficulties of achieving what we set out to do, to interweave the, the two things together. And at times, understandably, that, that caused some uh, polite friction in, in the committee, but not, un, not unused to polite friction in committees, <laughs> uh, put it like that. Uh, and so we went through a variety of drafts. We were always aware that the document had to be short for senior policymakers, senior investigators to find the time to read it. But at some, some stages of the drafting, instead of having what we now have, the final document is 36 pages, we had 140 pages. 
and each of what was said in those 140 pages was important. So then we had the challenging task of reducing from 140 to 36 without losing too much. And that exercised everybody quite a lot. But the, the final document is mostly aimed at countries which have not yet updated how they interview people, suspects, witnesses, and victims. So it's not really designed for, for, for say, the UK, because we, have, not me, but because of developments with, with, throughout the UK, we are perceived by others as, as leading the world in the law and developments and training. So it's not designed for us, and I have to keep remembering that. So when I kept saying, ah, oh, it's too simple, it doesn't say enough, they say, Ray, it's not written for the UK. You know, they would make up the non-existent country, you know, Wizzo Watso land, who torture people and don't know any better. That's what we're writing for. And I think it's a fantastic achievement, and I have to compliment my colleagues on producing something that has the essence, or more than the essence, of good investigative interviewing without having to go into too much detail that Wizzo Watso land might just think, oh, that's too much. I was thinking there must be quite a lot of resistance ahead, or even, I suppose, even when you bring it back to working as a practitioner, perhaps, you know, working with somebody and trying to kind of help them think about a different way of doing something. Mm, mm. This is on a major scale. If you think about trying to take your work into a different country to try and help people be curious about what they're doing and what perhaps other countries are doing and, and why would they want... To, I was just thinking about that level of resistance must be something to... Yeah, and... Remember. the. the the major people on, on the committee that brilliantly put the two disciplines together, they've done a brilliant job because what the document says, it, it doesn't say an over lot about you must not do something, partly because I, I wasn't the only psychologist on the committee, but we made the point that from the psychologist's point of view, it, you are unlikely to bring a, 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 a marked change, a positive change in behavior by merely telling people well, you must stop what you're doing. You have to offer a positive alternative. We know that. It's obvious to psychologists. But of course, the lawyers on the committee, they, they weren't aware of that. You know, I used to say, you know, all these countries that have signed up to this convention about not torturing years ago, and there's lo loads of laws, even in their own country, about not doing it, yet the investigators still do it. So just telling people not to do something is not very effective. You have to offer an alternative. Uh, and that has been taken on board. So, so what the document says is, obviously, it says to, to enter into torture or inhumane or cruel treatment is ethically inappropriate. But it says more about when you do that, you often, if you get any information, it's purposely rubbish. You know, if you think of serious crime investigations, terrorism, organized crime, etc., uh, people are trained to resist the accusatory uh, old style bad way of interviewing. And they're trained to appear to give in and then give false information. So you, you, you need a way of interviewing which doesn't give you false information. So the documents are very good on that. Uh, there's a whole section uh, on research that shows that if, you, if you enter into inhumane treatment, you actually get rubbish. And also what the document says is, you know, there's lots of research like I and Dave Walsh and others around the world have done showing that if you investigate in a way similar to the peace method, you actually get more and better quality information uh, as well as peripheral benefits like you know a terrorist organization uh, wishes often to to bring down a society because they disapprove of that society they think that society is a rubbish society so the more punitive you are as that society the more it justifies a terrorist position but if you deal with terrorists 
uh, like Professor Lawrence Allison's research on real life terrorism interview shows in a humane way, more of them choose to tell you and they give you more valid information. It's kind of counterintuitive, it's the opposite of common sense, but it, there's lots of research now in different countries. So in the document, it doesn't go overboard, fortunately, it did at the beginning, by saying, you must not do so-and-so. It said, hey, it's not a good idea to do so-and-so, what you need to do is this. So in one sentence, we talk about when you're interviewing a suspect, the last thing you want them to do is confess because it could be a false confession. But they may have done more than you think they've done. And they may want to confess to what you think they've done because it's less than what they have done. And that's often the case in serious crime. Uh, so it's a really good point that Laura's made and uh, I'll leave it to others to judge. But my opinion of the document is that it has done its very best to reduce the resistance of people who say, no, I don't want to change. Because if you want me to change, it implies that what I've been doing before was not good enough. It's framed as, it's more framed as, this is how to help you get even better. But we'll see. I'm positive about it, but I'm biased. Mm, it's a really good use of psychology though, in applying, I mean, all of what you're talking about is so helpful in applying our, the things we've learned into everyday behaviour, which is what we mm. all want to do, isn't it? Well, I was yeah. thinking, Ray, could you, could you explain for some of our viewers who might not be familiar with the PEACE method, what it is? Okay, so it's an acronym and people are under false impression that it was lazy liberal professors like me who came up with this acronym, you know, peace, peace man, peaceful 1960s hippies. Uh, no, the committee that came up with that label, it, 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 it's, it's a sad fact, but it has a positive part to it, that the detectives, 12 detectives who in around 1990 were gathered together to come up with a new idea because they had to be very experienced detectives who had lots of interviewing experience with difficult suspects. In those days, not now, all such persons were men. So there these 12 men, some of whom I knew, and some of them look more like criminals than criminals do. So these guys, it was they, not university people, they came up with the acronym PEACE, which you can see behind. That's why it's there. And the P, stands it says you must prepare and you must plan which is an obvious psychological thing but when you're investigating crime you're under a lot of pressures of all sorts but we know that almost the most important thing you can do for a successful investigative interview is plan and prepare properly so they, they talk a lot about that and of course they took some of that from from psychology and it says only when you've planned and prepared do you then begin the interview where you're required by law to explain to the interviewee why they're there. And there's another E that's in the first E, which is engage. Now, that sounds like getting married or a toilet that's busy. But these guys, they couldn't bring themselves to use the correct word, which we now use in the training, which is the French word rapport. So in order for somebody to decide to tell you something, they may not be fully happy or confident or willing, you know, a rape victim, for example, you're more likely for them to choose to give you information and to give you more information and valid information, the better you set up rapport with that person. But they use the word engage. So that's what the first E stands for. Explain and engage. And only when you've engage with the person only when you've been able to assist them to decide to talk to you do you then move on to the main purpose of the interview which is to get an account and there's lots of detail in that from psychology about free narrative question types don't ask closed questions all that standard stuff is way way in there and then it says something which was very surprising at the time when the interviewee has stopped giving you an account and you've done your best so you, you would normally walk out of the room, no, 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 you don't do that. You have this C for closure, which has two parts, where first of all, you, you, you go over what you think you've been told 
to check that you under, you've understood correctly what the person's trying to tell you. And you know, in a long interview, an interviewer cannot remember everything. And so if the interview has, interviewer has talked, they may have said things that you missed or because all human beings are biased, if they said information that was kind of different from what you expected, you may not have processed it. And then this was a very, very futuristic thing. The second part of closure, these dangerous looking guys said, is when the person leaves the interview, they have to be in a positive frame of mind as possible for two main reasons. One, you may want to talk to them again, or two, they will go back to their group and tell their group how well they were treated. And that was so modern and adventurous for these guys to put that in as part of the closure. So after doing that, the interview finishes, but then, because as I said, in England and Wales, the interviewing of suspects has been recorded since 86 and child interviews video recorded by 92 and then vulnerable adults video recorded. You have a recording of what you've done and to improve your skill, you should evaluate not only the information, but how well you did. So that's what peace stands for. And you can see how remarkable and adventurous it was for them to come up with that. No, it was just a comment, a reflection really. It's just, you know, it just keeps going back to that point of such a lovely example of a real world application of psychology to a, 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 another area, like the police and, and, and interviewing people, suspects involved in crime at that stage. It's such a good example of that, I think. Yeah, but if it hadn't been for that police psychologist, Tom Williamson, that may not have happened. Mm it was his idea it's amazing yeah so where do you hope to go with this way what do you hope the changes will be uh well obviously uh i personally and everybody else involved in developing the, the document called the principles of effective interviewing wishes it to have you know as big an impact as possible throughout the world as possible uh but of course in those countries which will most benefit from it are the kind of countries where they have limited resource for training or selection or salaries. And so what many of us are thinking about is the implementation stage, you know, how, how to assist organizations and countries uh, if they decide as we hope to implement all or part of the recommendations to, to help them, to help them do that. And my friends in Norway, uh, are beginning to construct some online training. Uh, and that, that, that's a very good idea. Uh, when I was working early on, on evaluating and trying to enhance with extra techniques, uh, the peace method, particularly work I did with Professor Coral Dando and Becky Milne, a lot of the work was developed in countries that can afford research, mostly you know, the, in the developed world, mostly westernized countries. And I always had a concern as to whether the basic aspects of the peace model, which Kate kindly invited me to, to describe, to what extent would they be translatable into very different cultures? Luckily, over the last 10 years or so, a great variety of researchers around the world have begun looking at the effectiveness or the trainability and effectiveness of the peace method investigative interviewing in very different countries. And uh, to my great relief, it does seem to be equally effective in all, all the countries where it has so far been studied. Obviously, there are slight differences. I remember a PhD I examined many years ago in the Netherlands, where that uh, person uh, managed to get recordings of real life tape recorded interviews of suspects and found that young adults who'd come from a culture where the police are enormously aggressive to a European culture where the police are not aggressive and more like the peace method. When the peace officer was trying to establish rapport, you know, sitting down, being calm, no physical violence, no vocal violence, asking them about their interests. Are you a soccer fan? Are you going to watch the Euros on TV? All that to establish rapport. This completely confused these guys. 
They didn't know what to do with a police officer who was being friendly when suspecting them of a serious crime. So I still, still want people to continue to, to evaluate and research in a variety of cultures. But at the moment, more than a dozen cultures, uh, even people on the uh, left-hand side of the Pacific Rim, there was a study there talking with the experts in those countries who've had to interview terrorists, real life terrorists, what they had found to be most useful. And these experienced investigators at the time of this study had knew nothing about the peace method. And amazingly, what they said was basically the essence of the peace method that they had learned over the years to get information from a senior member of a terrorist organization. That's that's the way they had found out to do it. So, but there may be certain people, and um, with the colleague at Derby, uh, Henrietta, we've just got a paper in submission. So, if the editor's watching, please. Uh, <laughs> on to what extent some aspects of the peace method, which in, in, involve rapport and the use of what psychologists call cognitive empathy, understanding where the person has come from that you're interviewing, trying to understand why they may, to, may, what, may have done what you suspect them of doing. So not effective empathy, of course, but cognitive empathy. Uh, and a PhD student of mine just submitted a PhD, uh, Bianca Baker. Uh, she's got two studies where she's analyzed real life interviews with suspects in serious sex crimes and looked if there's a relationship between the amount of interview or empathy and the amount of information coming from the suspect. And of course, there are issues about uh, caus causative relations. And Bianca has found that in both two separate studies, a uh, significant association between interview empathy and suspects talking a lot on topic in serious sex crimes. Mm -hmm. But of course, you three will know better than I, because you're a proper psychologist and I'm narrow in investigative interviewing that the literature suggests that people, you know, what I, I loosely call real psychopaths, you know, that the police sometimes have to interview, you know, would empathy work with them? I, I'm not sure. I mean, they, they're very smart, a lot of psychopaths, and uh, they may use it against you. Uh, but very briefly, off, off the record, I know of a real life case where a friend of mine was asked to advise the police because they were interviewing this psychopath and may have murdered loads of people. And the senior officers coming in in suit and tie were getting nowhere, that the suspect would pick up his chair, turn and face the wall and, not, and say nothing. And the police went to my, uh, my friend and said, uh, any advice? And he said, yes, you need somebody like that wonderful detective from the USA in the 60s, if you've ever seen him called Detective Columbo, who is highly skilled at pretending to be incompetent. Mm -hmm. And he said, get somebody like that. And they did. And it turned the whole thing around. And the, the, the accused then said lots of relevant stuff. So how best to interview very unusual people? I think that's an issue that we still need to look at. But of course, doing research on that is really, really difficult. I, I, I'm not in favor uh, of research where, for course credit, you ask undergraduates to to give you an account of whether they like orange juice or not. Mm -hmm. you know, I'm being over simple there, mm -hmm. but I think you know, to, to achieve what life has kindly, the cards life has kindly dealt me, which is to try to have impact in the real world, you have to be able to talk about research that's close to what the audience do. And as soon as you mention, I did this study with 100 undergraduates, you can see them all turn off, you know, they, they, mm -hmm. they're not interested in, mm -hmm. in that. Uh, we, you know, we, we do it sometimes because, because we need to check out basic theory and stuff like that. Uh, and, and that's great. But to claim that a study with undergraduates has, has close relevance to interviewing career criminals, I mm -hmm. think that's stretching it too far. Wider, do you think that sort of interviewing techniques go? I mean, is it something that's used 
or could it be used more widely in, in more forensic settings? You know, perhaps, it, I mean, just thinking about prisons when people commit offences in prisons and the officers have to deal with that, or in court settings when you have people wanting to get the best out, you know, people having a fair trial and wanting them to have the best yes. out, the victim's voice to be heard. Like how more widely does that? Well, I'm, I, I, thank you, Laura. Uh, you set me off on a, another train of <laughs> gibberish. Uh, I'm very interested in that and with a good friend of mine, uh, Dr Andy Griffiths, uh, we wrote a book chapter in a book edited by a couple of lawyers including Professor Penny Cooper, where we were talking about the best way for prosecution and defence to question people and Andy had kindly agreed with the draft title I suggested. So the title of our chapter is Advocating, because that's a pun on lawyers, advocates, advocating peace, colon, will it make people cross? Will they be annoyed that we say in their cross-examination, they, you know, they should stop trying to purposely get people to give mistaken evidence mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, and become like some, some defense lawyers are, are wonderfully skilled uh, at getting valid evidence from people who are not their own witnesses. I mean, that's what the jury want. They don't want to see uh, some, a, a complainant, particularly, uh, again, I'll try to keep calm, a, a person, whether they be male or female, who's in, alleging being raped. The last thing the jury want is to see any lawyer to unduly badger that person such that they produce an account that, in fact, is not accurate or valid. Uh, so certainly I'm quite interested, but of course, most of the world does not have the adversarial system we have. They have the inquisitorial system in which it's easier uh, to get this kind of way of talking with people. And many, many advers inquisitorial systems uh, are better uh, at talk getting information from people relevant to justice than our traditional adversarial symptoms. Uh, systems uh, yeah and but I want to uh, thank the medical profession because when we were sitting down getting the information from psychology to give to the guys developing the peace method in the early 1990s again by chance I've been involved in some developments about bringing psychology into medical training bringing psychology into the new at that time people who became physiotherapists were beginning to study for a degree, a BSc in physiotherapy, as opposed to going to college and not having it as university level education. And I was invited to play a role in bringing psychology into how physiotherapists can talk and get information from people who are obviously going through a variety of difficulties, some of which they didn't want to necessarily talk about and if you think about uh, the training of, of, of medical doctors uh, this particularly happened when I worked in Scotland I made a small contribution there because they were one of the first countries uh, to decide to have quite a lot of psychology in uh, in medical training and of course in medical training particularly for example in GPs you know you might go to a GP because you need help with something but what you want help with is a bit embarrassing. And so you don't necessarily, even you, though you go there willingly, you don't necessarily want to tell everything or I don't know, I don't want to be uh, too unpleasant here, but you know, people, doctors working in sexual transmitted disease departments, for example, they need to get a lot of information. And and because I began to be involved, I didn't write anything on it, but I was aware of the literature. Part of that was what went into the peace method. You can see the connection. Uh, so I think there are, as Laura said, there, there are many avenues in life uh, which I feel, if they are not already benefiting uh, from this peaceful way of getting information from people ethically, humanely that initially they may not have wanted to tell you i think that's that, that is important yeah
What aspirations do you have for your future, though, having done so much already? Uh, well, it might seem a bit lame, but I, I've never really had aspirations. I came from a very working class background. My parents left school at 14. I was the first person in, you know, I had lots of cousins, uncles and aunts in London. And I was the first person ever to do A-levels. And you know, I kind of slid into that. Uh, so whatever I've done is kind of been nothing to do with aspiration. Uh, and when people ask me about, you know, to, to give them advice, I always say, well, the most important thing is to be happy. So I aspire to be happy. That's a great aspiration for all of us. Mm. <laughs> yeah. Well, we really appreciate all your time today. It's been really fascinating and, and a sort of different area for us to sort of think about. Um, and we, um, we, you know, we really hope that people will sort of start to think more about this as an area for forensic psychologists and how we can apply so much of what we learn through our research. So it's been really fascinating. Um, so thank you very much for your time. And we will put the um, report in the show notes, the link to it. Well, thank you for inviting me. You're very welcome. It's lovely to see you again. And um, just remains for me to say, let's talk forensic psychology. Thank you.